termites. What are we drinking? A little beer called Mad Manatee from Jacksonville, Florida, which I actually picked up on the other side of Florida and brought home, but it looked good and it's actually pretty good. I don't mind it. Wait till you see this paper doll outfit. This is why I liked him though too, because he is um, an unsophisticated native as well. He wrote, for your annual midwinter trek back to visit the relatives in Buffalo, a low key but tastefully pant tasteful pants suit will surely convey that you're doing just fine in the city, thank you very much. Look, I don't know how much you can see. That looks like a Star Trek outfit. I mean, I don't, I, you can't buy this. Somebody must have had to just design these and then look at, look at the boots. It's just wonderful. I mean, I, I don't think that I would wear something like that. I don't know where you, well, he'd wear it anywhere. That's why he's totally ballsy. He doesn't even care. Let's see if he'll stand up. Let's see if he'll stand up right here. No, no. There. <laughs> All right. I didn't notice either that his cookbook, it says hundreds of delicious recipes for you from his seven dining rooms. <gasps> what? And his um, exhaust thing on top is a piano keyboard. Pretty fancy. I can't see what his apron says. Something fancy. Anyway, all right. We're back. He's with Shelley Winters, and then they're going on a train to promote the movie. Since Shelley's musical talent was limited, oh, they decided to send Liberace and George got to go. Shelley, who could be funny, convenient companion, away from the pressures of her career, made friends with all of the musicians except Liberace. What? He had remained as frightened of her as he'd been during the filming. Early one morning at the Muleback Hotel in Kansas City, Shelley found out she was too stimulated by the evening's performance to sleep. It was 3 a.m. and she was hungry. She took the elevator down to the coffee shop where she found Liberace sitting before a cup of coffee at the counter and sat down beside him. Insomnia, she asked. He nodded. Happens to me all the time. I start thinking about things that I can't stop. You know what I'd like? What? A hot fudge sundae. I've been starving myself for a year and I stay to hell with it. He grinned. Me too. Let's grow fat together. She did. Uh, Shelly and Lee often met for early morning con consolation over hot fudge Sundays. They also joined with Bobby True and his musicians in sessions aboard the trains. When they were en route from St. Louis, I believe Shelly Winters is from St. Louis, too. I guess I should Google that. Uh, while they were en route from St. Louis to Chicago, a porter entered Shelly's compartment and smelled the air. You kids can get in trouble for smoking that stuff, he warned. What stuff, Shelly asked. She looked at the musicians' cigarettes and the happy expressions on their faces. You mean, you mean that isn't tobacco? Oh my God, get rid of it. You know what happened to Mitchum? Robert Mitchum had been, had served a jail term in 1949 after being arrested while smoking pot with a starlet. Oh, in an apartment. What? They went into people's apartment? Or a train apartment. Although Liberace was well-reviewed in his hometown, Shelley Winters and South Sea were not. Commenting on the personal appearances at the Riverside Theater, that's in Milwaukee too, the Milwaukee Journal reviewer commented that the not-so-bashful blonde sang the usual sexy song in an un usually unpleasant off-key voice. Oh, that's not good. However, it would, while Shelley played the star, it was our boy Walter Liberace who shone like one, the breakness pianist who played his way from Milwaukee High, West Milwaukee High School and Milwaukee night spots to the White House and the Waldorf Astoria staged a tingling display of the classic boogie woogie and jazz that had the customers beating their palms in approval. Oh. The reviewer termed the movie a masterpiece of misunderstanding and cited that Winters, Winters as a streamlined poor man's May West. Oh, bam. He added, oh yes. Liberace has a hoagie Carmichael type of role as a waterfront saloon piano player, and he comes through nobly. Oh, I bet Liberace loved that. The tour is mostly a success, but the South Sea Center sank of its own ponderous weight. Shelley and Liberace didn't meet again until many years in Las Vegas. She found he was still uneasy around her. Hello, Mom, it's Walter. Liberace's mother received the telephone call that the ice cream franchise store she operated in Milwaukee. 
his mom's working in an ice cream shop? Maybe she wanted to. My goodness, where are you? I'm in Chicago playing the Palmer House. Look, I want you to come down. Well, I don't know if I can leave the store. Please, it's important. George would like to see you too. I suppose I can get someone to watch the place. Yes, I'll come. Francis Liberace Castadante welcomed her chance to see her much-traveled sons and to escape the daily grind of running an ice cream parlor. Well, why the fuck? He's so generous. What? Maybe she wanted to. Seems like he gave her everything. As always, Walter had her hotel room filled with flowers, but, she se but he seemed especially excited when he greeted her. Mom, I bought a house in North Hollywood, he announced. It's a nice little house on a street called Camelia. Oh, I'm so glad you're settling down, she said. Well, I don't know about that, but at least I'll have a place to come home to. And you know what, Mom? What? I want you to be there. Sell the ice cream store and come to California. You'll love it out there. I know you will. Oh, bingo. That's it. Come on. Yeah, let's keep getting old. It's too cold in Milwaukee. Enough's enough. Get somewhere warm. Mom was startled by the proposal. She'd spent most of her life in her near Milwaukee and expected to end her days there. But now Angelina was married and raising her own family and Rudy was on his own. The prospect of living with Walter and sharing the excitement of his career seemed exciting. Within a week, she sold the ice cream store and moved her belongings to California. Good for her. From his earliest days in the honky-tonks of Milwaukee, Liberace never lacked total confidence in his capacity to entertain. He never suffered the agonies of stage fright or what show business calls flop sweat, the fear of flopping, that afflicted other performers. Part, partly that was due to his symbiotic relationship with the piano, his total insurance that he, assurance that he could use the instrument to please, charm, amuse, and excite listeners. His 30th birthday prompted Liberace to reassess his career. Yes, he was earning big money now, three grand a week, but he felt a vague dissatis dissatisfaction. The failure of the South Sea Center contributed to it. So far, he'd not been able to reach a mass audience. Mostly, he played the conventioneers and expense account spenders in hotel supper clubs. He wanted to reach a wider public. In a rare moment of self-doubt, he wondered if he had the drive and will to achieve such a goal. Amazingly, he found his resolve in a book. Claude M. Bristol was a West Coast newspaper man and a veteran of World War I who discovered the self-help industry before others were per purveying positive thinking and success through intimidation. Oh, I wouldn't want to do that. Why would you want to intimidate people? That doesn't seem very nice. As a reporter, he, he was fascinated by the persuasive power of human, mind, of human minds of Mormonism, Christian science, holy rollers, and evangelicals like, evangelic, evangelicals like Billy Sunday and Amy Simple McPherson. Never heard of her. Now I'm going to have to giggle her. Belief is the motivating force that enables you to achieve your goal, Bristol concluded. If you are ill and the thought or belief is embedded in you that you will recover, the odds that you will do so are in your favor. If it's the belief or basic confidence within you that brings outward or material results. Bristol embodied his beliefs in a book, in a booklet, TNT. It rocks the earth. He traveled the country spreading his positivism. Is that a word? What do I know? I'm just an unsophisticated native. To gatherings of business executives, doctors, lawyers, and other. In 1948, Prentice Hall pu published his book, The Magic of Believing, and it became an instant bestseller. Among the thousands who bought a copy was Liberace. He poured through the book with astonished eyes. In these pages was his own personal philosophy and more. The revelation was breathtaking. All he had to do was follow the author's precepts and success. Nay, triumph was his. Triumph. Um, how many times have you heard it said, just believe you can and you can? Whatever the task is, if it is begun with the belief you can do it, it will be done perfectly. That is just a bunch of shit. I mean, I'm not uh, negative. I don't care how many times, times I try math. It, it's not going to be right. And I go into it with the belief that it's right. I even turned in homework thinking, fucking ace that. No, probably a C minus if I was lucky. I mean, I think you should try to be optimistic, but that's just ridiculous. One belief enables a person to do what other thinks is impossible. It is the act of believing that is the starting force or generating power that leads to this accomplishment. Come on, fellows, we can beat them, shouts someone in the command, whether a football game or a battlefield or in the strife of the business world. That sudden voice of belief, challenging and electrifying, reverses the tide and victory, success! 
from defeatism to victory. Well, what if both sides are yelling it? Huh? What if we got Alabama playing Auburn and it's tied? And they're both going, we can do it. Somebody didn't do it. Most likely Auburn. Sorry, I prefer them because of my friend Vic. War Eagle. Roll Tide is the other one. I'm just saying, this is like, a, what was that one? Oh, crap. It was on that guy. The, the, it was about the power of believing. The secret. So here was my problem with the secret. This is just logic. It's not even a feeling. It's, he says, you know, for instance, if you drive into a parking lot at Christmas at the mall, it's going to be crowded. And if you just think really hard, I'm going to get a good parking spot. Okay, go ahead, try. But what if everyone's thinking that? Then y'all, it can't happen. Oh, somebody will luck out. Did they think harder? The magic of b believing per permeated Liberace's life ever afterwards. He memorized key portions of the book and applied them to everyday experience. He avoided being moody, becoming moody or depressed. I am strong. I am happy. I am convincing. I am friendly. Everything is fine. These are just a few simple affirmations you can use to change your mental point of view for the better. Probably. I believe that. But I don't know that magical shit's going to happen. If a musical uh, conductor had a pessimistic attitude, he was banned from the Liberace dressing room before a performance. Yeah, you don't need that shit before a show. Or after a show, really. I wouldn't want that either. When you permit negative thoughts of doubt and fear to enter your consciousness, it's obvious that the forceful, positive, creative thoughts will have to give way. And consequence, consequently, you will lose your positive state. Sure. Reporters visiting Liberace residences often noticed the abundance of mirrors. That was not pure vanity. A prime element of the Bristolian theory was the mirror technique. The author observed that Winston Churchill, Woodrow Wilson, and Billy Sunday, as well as their other, other statesmen, orators, preachers, and actors, practiced their craft before mirrors. Okay. If I saw any comedian practicing in front of a mirror, I would think they... Lost their minds in some way, shape, or form. But, I mean, I don't know. Maybe speaker people. I, I feel like if you're a good preacher, you can just do it. You, it comes naturally. You don't... There was that one cheese ball that... The, the sweat lodge guy. I saw him practicing and some, some documentary they did about him. And, like, he would say, when I, when I say to the people, we're going to move forward, I go, Forward! I mean, how cheesy, right? You would pick up on that. If I was in the audience, I'd go, that's not a normal thing. As you stand before the mirror, keep telling yourself that you're going to be an outstanding success and nothing in the world is going to stop you. Does this sound silly? Don't forget that every idea presented to the subconscious mind is going to be produced in its exact counterpart in an objective life. And the quicker your subconscious gets the idea, the sooner your wish becomes a picture of power. Uh, maybe. I'd go halfway in on that one. When Liberace decided late in his career he wanted to appear at Radio City Music Hall, his advisors were strongly opposed. He persisted. And the engagement was a triumph! Jimmy Gribbo, well known to sports fan, is a manager of prize fighters who had made winners of many boxers by teaching them how to visualize themselves as winners, and they became winners. When Liberace began wearing outlandishly lavish costumes on stage, critics ridiculed him and berated him. He responded by dressing even more garishly. You've seen in the movies and plays how badly dressed, ordinary-looking girls can be transformed to the most attractive women by beautiful clothes and the latest style of hairdo. You can do the same thing, and you will speed up the process if you continue to hold the mental picture of your new self and never relax for a second. Whew, that sounds hard. After... He had become a national figure. figure uh, Liberace acknowledged his debt to the magic of believing by sponsoring a special Liberace edition of the book. Well, now I want to get this book, even though I think half of it's bullshit. Maybe half of it works. The picture, his picture was featured on the cover, and he wrote an introduction citing how Bristol's teaching has changed his life as he stood on the brink of fame. Uh, the Verities is interpreted by Liberace. This is what it says. To experience happiness, one must express happiness. To find love, one must give love. To possess wealth, one must value wealth. To acquire health, one must live health. 
Right. To attain success, one must think, one must positively think success. All right. I mean, that seems pretty basic. Armed with his newfound knowledge, Liberace contemplated how he could attain far greater success than he had known. He came to one escapable conclusion. He needed better management. George was perfectly capable of arranging transportation and checking spotlights, but he was no strategist of the Liberace career. MCA was expert at arranging dates and making contracts, but it had no concern for Liberace's future. Liberace wanted to make the change without hurting George's feelings. He found a way. I need you to devote full time to the music, George. It would be a great help to me if you would conduct the orchestra on all the dates. Pick out the new arrangements, too, and hire the musicians. I think we could get a management company out of New York or L.A., people who can give us the kind of attention we need. George received the proposal with enthusiasm. Well, good for George, so he wasn't like being like a jackass where he's going to start pouting and shit. He felt much more comfortable with the music than the business anyway. He began asking bookers to recommend management firm. That name that kept recurring was Gabe, Lutz, and Heller of Hollywood. They had all sprung from the big, ba big band music. Dick Gabe had managed Jimmy Dorsey. Sam Lutz was Lawrence Welk's man. Lawrence Welk. Oh, he could have used that. Yeah. The bubbles were great, but you got to more than that, yeah. Um, they had formed a management company after the war with the, he did, did but, but you don't need no, it's all boring people. We don't know. George Liberace began sending notes and postcards to Gabe Lutz and Heller. Lee sold out seven nights at the Baker hotel in Dallas, standing ovations every night at the Cal Neva lodge here in Lake Tahoe. One day George walked into the offices of Gabe Lutz and Heller over the day, over the daily variety office on Vine street, just North of Hollywood Boulevard. So you're the guy who sent us all the postcards said Sam Lutz and uh, a blunt spoken man. My brother's playing the Orpheum Theater downtown. I wish you guys would come down and see his act. After all your build up, I guess we should, said Seymour Heller, a man with shrewd eyes and a balding head. That, that doesn't sound fun. Lutz and Heller agreed to make the pil pilgrimage to the Orpheum, Orpheum Theater and they were unimpressed. What? They were unimpressed by Liberace's performance. The cavernous old movie the cathedral was sparsely occupied by Latinos and women shoppers resting their feet. All of Liberace's usual endearments failed to evoke a response and he finished a faint applause. Oh God, you worked this hard to get, why did you pick this place? Ugh. Backstage, George offered excuses. Uh, their message was clear. We don't think we can do anything for you at this time. That's all right, Lee said chief cheerfully. Maybe someday you will. Three weeks later, George returned to the Gabe Lutz and Heller office and said, you didn't get to see Lee under the best conditions. He's opening the Hotel Del Coronado next weekend, and I guarantee you he'll be a sensation. I'd like you to come down there as our guest. No need, Sam Lutz said. I was planning to take my family down there anyway. On Saturday afternoon, Sam Lutz was sitting on the beach in front of the elegant Victorian Hotel Del Coronado watching his children play in the surf. His companion was Leo Robin, lyricist of all these songs. Why don't you come to uh, the uh, to Tijuana tonight? Thanks, but I got to catch an act at the circus room tonight. Let's said Liberace. What's a Liberace? He plays the piano. Do me a favor. Skip the match. Skip Tijuana. You and your wife come and hear this guy with us. He wants Seymour and me to manage him. I'd like your professional opinion. Robin agreed. During the middle of Liberace's show that night, Let's glanced over and saw sweat on Robin's forehead. This guy's amazing, the songwriter said. He does some tricks of modulation on that piano I've never heard before. Sign him, Sam. On the following Monday, Liberace Brothers appeared at the offices to sign a seven-year management contract. Well, good for them. As my friend Rocky Laporte, the comedian, would say, good for you. Good for you. They did it. The magic of believing. Now I'm going to go get that book. All right, termites. How's everybody doing? Good? It's almost been a year since I've been off the road. Sad times, right? But the fall looks very promising. I'll be back out there everywhere. I don't know if the schedule's updated on the website. Everybody keeps, um, I mean, kind of, but check. And um, that's all I got, termites. Pull up your sheet. Know that you're a good termite and you're a worthy termite. And are you ready? Close your eyes. Night-night termites. <laughs>